It'd be a hard sales pitch to walk into the Bank of Andy and say, rip out your ACH rail and use Ripple. Mm -hmm. He'd kind of be like, look, that's not a big problem. That's not a big friction point. But if I go in and say to him, hey, your cross-border transactions, you're like, oh, that's a high friction point. My customers are frustrated that there's no transparency in the transaction. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to adopt Ripple. What happened, which we didn't really expect in Japan, is because the Japanese local rail isn't particularly efficient, we had all these banks talking to us about cross-border. They're like, well, wait a minute. Can't we use this domestically? Right. Yeah, you can pay, use it domestically. within Japan. Correct. And so we have, I think, now 63 banks that have signed up in Japan. It covers 40% of all accounts in Japan. Uh, they're in the process of going live uh, within Japan. What percentage of your business right now are these Japanese banks? Or, uh, or at least the I relationships honestly, in Japan? Well, in terms of the number of banks, it's over 50%. of it. I mean, we publicly announced we work with over 100 financial institutions around the world. I, mean, I just, I think, said I, we're, I think it's 63 in Japan. So... You know, it's a big percentage. Wow. Uh, you know, lots of ways to measure business, revenue, volume, all these kinds of things. So uh, depends how you, like everything, depends how you cut the data. When so why is, it, why is it like that there? And are there other countries that have that sort of same problem slash opportunity? Yes. Uh, you know, back to the peanut butter manifesto, life yes. is about focus. <laughs> Ripple is focused on a cross-border settlement problem, mm. cross-border liquidity. The reason why our first corridor is into the Mexican peso is because the local rails in Mexico are extremely efficient. There's a local efficient. rail, very efficient, more efficient than ACH. Okay. The local rail in Mexico is called SPE. You can get from one regulated financial institution to another regulated financial institution inside Mexico in under an hour. So that means if I light up one regulated financial institution in Mexico, I can enable payments into any account in Mexico within an hour. It's pretty cool. Okay, so within it needs to be efficient, but it's point the external part's got to be inefficient. Correct. I mean, cross border. Right. Like the the, the, the lowest common denominator for cross border transactions is enabled through SWIFT. It's enabled through this correspondent banking network, yeah. and there are a very small number of banks who dominate that, and they they extract billions of dollars of profit from the rest of the banks. They sit on the top. You know, when you ask why is Jamie Dimon, you know, saying things about, uh, I mean, Jamie Dimon, well, actually, Citi is kind of number one, HSBC is probably number two, but JPM is way up there at the top, and they're making a lot of money from other banks. When we go talk to banks, 99.9% .9 of banks, they're like, we want Ripple to be successful because I'm sick of paying these guys, and, you know, they're taking a lot of money from me that I then have to take from my customer, and why do I want to feed Citi to be more competitive with me in this local market? Or at the very least, they've heard that blockchain is hot and they need to be doing something in blockchain. <laughs> There's some truth to that, too. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure we hit this. You know, you were talking earlier about the FUD and some misunderstandings about XRP, and, and I appreciate that we're sort of addressing that. One question I, I want to raise and just see if there's an updated take on. You got into it on Twitter with a reporter. We were talking about uh, whether the banks that have been announced as being partners of Ripple are really using Ripple. And there was just kind of a, an interesting exchange. I, you know, you kind of jumped on there on Twitter. That got a lot of attention. Any, any thinking there? Or? Look, uh, I'm, I'm going to choose my words a little bit carefully. <laughs> I think particularly in today's political climate, real facts are really important. And it, when I believe people are uh, not, are, are manipulating at the margin information, I think that is, it's, it's just bad for journalism. Do you think that in general, the cryptocurrency space has had you know, a lot of problems in the media. I mean, I think I know the answer, but there's just so much misinformation out there. And you, know, you have a, a, a website like Coindesk, which we're partnering with today. You know, they are a trade publication. They, they cover a lot of this stuff sort of expertly. We cover a lot of crypto, but then I noticed in the explosion of December, you know, you've now got a lot of websites that some, some editor is telling people, hey, cover Bitcoin, and it's, and it's tough to get everything right. It's, look, this is an adolescent stage of this industry. It's incredibly important to me for the success of Ripple, but for the whole ecosystem, for the whole industry to mature. And I think that applies to the media coverage. Uh, it, you know, it's really frustrating when you go out and you read people who haven't really scratched the surface to understand the facts. And look, I think I don't view other blockchain companies as competitors because a lot of them are going after completely different use cases. Hmm. We like the early days of the internet. You know, Yahoo was not competing with Amazon. They were totally different things. They, the internet needed yeah. to grow up. Right. Well, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Right. Fast forward to 20 years later. But my, my point is, I want all boats to rise. 
I think an important element of the, the maturation of this industry is also the maturation of the coverage of, uh, I mean, all aspects. Are, are you concerned, Brad, about